Um, I begin by saying that I'm, I'm delighted to see that this process is taking place. Um, and I hope it develops from here. I can't remember a time when we had uh, so much open involvement um, from both sides in the analysis of the uh, of Irish budgetary policy. Uh, I think it's been, it's been lacking for a long time. Um, and if the, semester, the European semester did nothing else but promote that kind of open debate, I think it will have turned out to be very well uh, worthwhile. Um, may I also slightly take issue with um, what the chairman said at his, in his initial remarks. He said that it's an opportunity for us to discuss the Irish programme. That's true. We could, of course, be discussing the French programme or the German programme or the um, Slovakian programme uh, because this is part not just of the post bailout surveillance of the Irish economy, it's part of the surveillance of the economies of the European Union. Uh, I think it's important to make that point, not least because uh, it has become fashionable among the Irish media to make the point that we poor Irish are subject to all this kind of interference from that other crowd over there in Brussels, or even worse, over there in Berlin. Um, they are bad enough in their own ways, but uh, we're not the only ones who are subject to that kind of surveillance. It's, it's a common um, effort on the part of the, for the European Union. Um, in another bit of my life, uh, I do some public affairs work. And whereas for the purpose of today's discussion, CSR stands for country-specific recommendations, in the other bit of my life, it stands for corporate social responsibility. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. I mean, there are some cynics who, who don't like the idea. Corporate social responsibility goes, I suppose, on one end of the spectrum from the Heineken Cup uh, in rugby uh, to, at the other end, um, other very worthwhile events that are sponsored by people who don't seem to have anything to gain out of it. And without going into the politics of any issue today, I would give you the instance at the other end of the spectrum of what used to be known as the GPA piano competition. Uh, I don't think I ever met anybody at any of those concerts who was going to rush out and lease a few aircraft from GPA just because they ran a piano competition. So the spectrum is there. But corporate social responsibility has a meaning. Uh, and I think it is something that the, the Commission uh, might reflect about. And I've come to what I mean by that. Um, these country-specific recommendations uh, are based for each member state on a set of priorities set out in the annual growth survey published at the end of last year by the Commission. And in the end of 2013, uh, the growth survey identified five priorities. They were pursuing differentiated growth-friendly fiscal consolidation, restoring lending to the economy, promoting growth and competitiveness for today and tomorrow, tackling unemployment and the social consequences of the crisis, and modernizing public administration. I don't think anybody could argue that these are not appropriate priorities, but they're not the whole story. The first two of those priorities, that is, pursuing differentiated, growth-friendly fiscal consolidation and restoring lending to the economy, they seem to me to concern areas in, in, in which the Commission shows a lack of responsibility, a lack of appreciation of what I would call corporate social responsibility in, in the political field. The annual growth survey on which this is all based makes no reference to monetary policy. Monetary policy figures nowhere in the European semester. And that suggests to me that the erroneous mindset that held that the crisis in the Eurozone is at root a fiscal crisis continues to reign. And that, in my view, is to everybody's detriment. For as long as this continues to be the case, the European semester process will, I think, be an elegant, internally consistent, suitably rigorous and effective recipe for stagnation. Without monetary policy, without an appropriate monetary policy framework, um, 
and the mechanisms of a properly designed monetary union, um, the kind of policies we're talking about here, fiscal policy, will not make the kind of contribution to the restoration of growth uh, that everybody um, claims to be in favour of uh, these days. Sound fiscal policy absolutely needs the underpinning of an appropriate monetary policy. Um, and for those of you uh, who, who have a bit of uh, courage and, uh, and a strong stomach uh, and who weren't there, I would recommend that you have a look at the IAEA's website and look at the, the address that Martin Wolf made uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I think the points are extremely well made there, um, not just about monetary policy, but also about the unprecedented nature of having such a tight fiscal um, organization uh, in, in such uh, a loosely defective uh, political structure such as we have in, in the European Union. The Commission may argue, and I'm sure it will, that monetary policy is the domain of an independent European Central Bank. That indeed is the case. But the European Central Bank, like the rest of us, has to operate in the real world. There were and there are very sound reasons for setting an inflation target of, and I quote, close to 2%. We're nowhere near that at the moment, and there are no reasons to fear the danger of an overshoot in inflation in the foreseeable future. Independent actors like the ECB are not precluded by their independence from dialogue with other interested parties, neither are they precluded uh, from drawing their own conclusions from such a dialogue. Perhaps there is one little chink of light on the horizon there. Last week, uh, according to reports, the European Central Bank, and I think its Board of Governors, held a seminar to which they invited uh, a number of outside commentators, including, as far as I can remember, Martin Wolf. Uh, I would dearly like to have been a fly on the wall uh, at that meeting, because I'm sure the, the debate uh, would have been very interesting. Um, we do need uh, a, a marked change of, of attitude and energy on the part of the European Central Bank. And I, I think uh, a good many people will share with me the impression that if the present governor of the ECB, Mario Draghi, were given his head, uh, monetary policy might indeed make a more substantive contribution to livening up life uh, in the Eurozone. Um, as it is, he seems to be obliged to make the kind of uh, rather obscure, opaque uh, statements that maybe something might happen at the end of this year uh, if things are going rather well. Um, if, if, if the history of the last seven years shows us anything at all, it is that small measures that go in the right direction are pretty much a waste of time. Um, and I could say, if you look back at the history of economic policy and budgetary policy in this country over the last 30 years, you'll come to the same conclusion. Um, if you're going to make a change, make a lot of change very quickly. Um, that was well illustrated to me many years ago by the first Polish finance minister after independence, who, who was talking about structural change in the economy. And he said to a group of us, he said, I have a market that's not a market, it was still a command economy. I have a currency that's not a currency, it wasn't convertible. Uh, and I have a political system that isn't yet a political system. And he said, we have to change that. And he argued that all the change had to happen very quickly. Um, and because some of us looked at him a bit aghast at the nature of what he was proposing, he said, if you in Ireland decided that instead of driving on the left, you would drive on the right, you couldn't just start with the buses. Uh, and, and the lesson really is that if you're going to get the benefit of making a substantial change in policy, it has to be a very substantial change made quickly. And the kind of incremental reaction that we have seen to the fiscal crisis, to the fiscal problems we have, to the Eurozone crisis, and indeed to, to others, um, small incremental steps uh, are very largely a waste of time. Uh, they use up huge amounts of political energy uh, and get very little result. Um, who remembers, or who can forget, the amount of political energy we used up in this country to pass the fiscal treaty, which only now begins to have relevance to us? 
uh, perhaps what, what's in it will turn out to have been useful. It would turn out to have been an awful lot more useful than it is today if we had real progress in, resorting, in resolving the monetary problems of the Eurozone. Having said all that, which is not really concerned directly with the, uh, I was about to say the corporate social irresponsibility, but the country-specific recommendations, um, I come to the, the recommendations uh, themselves. Um, this, our government submitted its national reform programme and stability programme last April with the endorsement of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, another very, very useful uh, innovation uh, in our system. The Commission broadly agrees with the forecast for 2014 and 2015, but it's important to point out it enters a number of caveats. It says that the authorities' forecasts for the later years of the programme uh, are optimistic. Um, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I would have to say that in terms of sanguinity, uh, I'm very much on the, the, the minus side of, of official Ireland. Um, and I think if you review, if you look at um, even the government's own analysis uh, of the difference between the forecast for last year and the outturn for last year, you'll see that the tendency to optimism is not entirely gone. Um, the Commission makes the point that the achievement of budgetary targets is not supported by sufficiently detailed targets for 2015. As a result, the Commission deficit forecast for 2015 is higher than the target recommended by the Council. The Commission believes that the programme's targets are consistent with the requirements of the Stability and Growth Pact, but need to be supported by specific measures from 2015 onwards. It makes the point that medium-term budgetary plans are not supported by well-specified adjustment measures and are subject to revisions at the time of annual budget decisions. A very, very prescient remark, um, and I think the end of this year will be very interesting uh, to see just what kinds of revisions we might see then. And finally, it says that the medium-term expenditure ceilings are not sufficiently constrained by legally binding specific adjustments. Uh, I think perhaps that point um, has, been, has been dealt with. But I agree with the, um, the view that the forecasts for the period after 2015 uh, are optimistic. Now, to be fair, uh, the government's documents point out in a number of places that there are qualifications to the presentation. Um, and the stability programme itself, as presented by the government, contains a, a sensitivity analysis on page 26, which I think is, is a very useful addition uh, to, to the documentation. For the rest, the Commission's quibbles seem to be to be rather disingenuous because the European semester process itself gives uh, the Commission and the Council further opportunities to have an input into the process uh, before it's finalised. They get another bite of the cherry before the budget proposals are brought out in October. So it seems to me that some of those caveats uh, are there just to make us all believe that the Commission is alive and well and doing the work it's supposed to do, um, but they're not things to worry about hugely. But there are some further caveats and some uh, qualifications that they make to the rec before coming to the recommendations. The Commission says that there is further scope to improve the efficiency and growth friendliness of the tax system and that there is scope to improve the effectiveness of environmental tax instruments uh, and scope for removing environmentally harmful subsidies. Um, I was amused to see a letter in the Irish Times the other day from a resident of a housing estate in Cork who said, yesterday uh, the uh, Ishka Erin people were here installing meters. There was no protest, and there were no media here to record the fact that there was no protest. Um, I wonder if that's what the Commission has in mind when it talks about the effectiveness of environmental tax instruments. In the health sector, it says, financial management and accounting systems and processes are fragmented across healthcare providers. This hinders the monitoring of healthcare expenditure and efforts to achieve value for money and an appropriate allocation uh, of resources. Um, I wonder, um, have they reflected uh, on the effectiveness of binding expenditure ceilings uh, in that sector? Uh, there seems to me to be a real problem uh, there. Maybe the bindingness isn't big enough 
or maybe the ceilings aren't appropriate, but there is an issue there that will certainly come up before the end of this year. It makes the point, that is, the Commission in its commentary before the recommendations, it says replacement rates are relatively high for the long-term unemployed with low income potential and other categories of workers depending on family circumstances. I have to say that I find that remark to be crass in the extreme. It speaks of replacement rates being relatively high for long-term unemployed with low income potential. The long-term unemployed with low income potential are people who are in danger of remaining long-term unemployed. So the very concept of replacement rates for those people is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, and I think if we're going to have a look at reordering um, our social support system, we shouldn't start from, from, from that kind of point. Uh, it makes the point that dedicated schemes and funds have been put in place to improve access to finance for SMEs, but so far the take-up has been low. Uh, that, that's actually quite true, uh, and I'm not sure if we, if we have fully uh, understood the reasons for that take-up being low. Um, there is, of course, a new provision uh, with German-provided funds uh, specifically to be directed uh, at SMEs, and it will be interesting to see how that is organised uh, and how it actually works out in practice. Um, and it makes the point that John has mentioned already about household and SME deleveraging um, continuing. The recommendations on the whole seem to me to be uh, rather well focused, and I don't think that in terms of general direction the government will have any major problem with them. Uh, but there are a couple of specific points I'd like to make uh, uh, about this. First one, the process of pursuing a structural adjustment towards the medium-term objective of reducing the deficit by at least 0.5% of GDP a year and putting the general government deficit on a sustained downward path will be extremely difficult in the current monetary climate. And I come back to this issue of the monetary policy underpinning. Um, if we don't have um, a properly active and effective uh, monetary policy approach, all of this process is going to last for much longer and it's going to continue to be uh, extremely difficult uh, and painful. Um, second comment I'd make is that there's a, there's a recommendation, number four, uh, which includes the proposal to tackle low work intensity of households and address the poverty risk of children through tapered withdrawal of benefits and supplementary payments upon return to employment. That seems to me to be absolutely essential and long overdue. And it makes me very, very angry to reflect that we first started talking about the need to taper benefits on return to employment over 30 years ago. 30 years ago, there might have been some excuse for it. At that point, we had information systems in the Department of Health and the Department of Social Welfare. We had multiple information data retention systems in those departments that couldn't even talk to each other within those departments. In the meantime, we've had PPARs, which has been you know, one of the great fiascos of our time. But surely we should have arrived at the point today where our public expenditure uh, system uh, could operate a tapered system of withdrawal of benefit when people return to work and get rid for good and all uh, of this uh, business, this argument that we constantly have about whether or not there are poverty traps. We know that there are, and there is no great rocket science in figuring out uh, what needs to be done to get rid of them, but we're still at the point where we haven't even begun to think about how we would do this. Uh, mind you, if I could betray for a moment, um, to your great surprise, a slight political bias, I would have to say that our system has been damned for generations by this nonsensical idea of universal entitlement, so beloved of left-wing parties around the world, but that's maybe another day's work. Uh, but it does seem to me that if we could ever get some effective outside pressure on our benighted system to operate a tapering production of benefits, uh, we would do something really worthwhile uh, for groups of people in our, in our society who have been 
very badly served. Um, third comment I'd make is that recommendation number six um, asks the government to announce ambitious targets for the conclusion of the restructuring of mortgage loans in arrears of more than 90 days. Again, that seems to me uh, to be long overdue. Um, I remember a time not so long ago when one of the senior people in, in the central bank um, got great plaudits for describing the banks as teenagers who hadn't yet grown up in the way they were approaching their job. Um, I think it was probably a, a, a well-merited comment. Um, but it seems to me that it's time for both the central bank and our government administration to move past the point they have reached. Um, they need to be more determinedly prescriptive uh, in, in telling the banks and mortgage lenders uh, how to deal with this issue. Um, uh, John has just said, and I'm not sure that he, he would be too keen on being fully taken up literally on it, but provision has been made in the recapitalization of our financial institutions for what was seen to be or considered to be um, the, the, the risk to their balance sheets at the time of the recapitalization. Now, that's making all the qualifications in advance. But it seems to me that uh, the prospect of capital write-downs having to be made is inevitable for all of the financial institutions, certainly for mortgages that are in arrears, whatever solution uh, they choose. Um, even today's most optimistic property market observers, and isn't it interesting to notice how our national newspapers, property supplements, are getting to look more and more like the way they did uh, in the middle of the boom. But I don't think even the most optimistic um, gilders of the lily in, in that business uh, would expect prices to get back anywhere near where they were in 2006 uh, in the immediate future. So sorting out the problems of mortgage holders in arrears, whatever way it's done, whether it's by repossession or buy to let or split mortgages or simply debt write down, is going to be a costly business. And I think the principle of making an effective change quickly applies here also. If they're going to take a capital hit, which they are, they should take it rapidly uh, so that we get rid of most of the problem as quickly as we can uh, and finally get to the point where the fundamentals of the economy are beginning uh, to, 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 to work and to mean what they look like meaning uh, on the surface. Um, having said all that, as I said at the beginning, I think this whole process is, is a huge improvement uh, in the way that we can look at budgetary policy uh, and I hope that it's taken royally uh, by, by all of those here. Uh, I wish that I could say that it would be taken equally seriously uh, by the million and a half people who vote in this country, but that's probably for another day. Thank you.